Well, it's three o'clock. Um, I guess I'll get started. Welcome folks from Walters Gardens as well as Katie from Prides. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and, and we can certainly have a conversation uh, with it being a small group. It's a little different than the, than the new one um, that Tim provided earlier and, and Laura provided yesterday. Hi, Kate. We liked that one yesterday. That was nice. <laughs> We're from Prides. Yeah. Yep. So I don't know if you guys joined our uh, Proven Winners virtual roadshow that we did back in November. Did, you, did anybody from Prides join that? No, I don't think so. So this is a presentation we gave for that one. So it's not a totally original one for Mance, but um, what we do in this, this sort of presentation is we, we have our 15 proven winter perennials for the landscape. And that's the backbone of any of those presentations that we do for, for our virtual roadshow. And when we do outreach to landscapers, that's always the backbone of the presentation. And we try to feature folks like you that, that carry all or the majority of those 15 and talk about you folks as well. Um, and then uh, we build it out a little bit beyond the 15. This presentation will have about 30 that are ideal for landscapes and, and, uh, and try to explain the reasons why they're really good. Um, so, you know, if we're talking to designers and, and architects and such, why design with proven winners perennials? Um, of course, the unparalleled consumer marketing where we collect a little bit of, of a marketing fee with every plant that we sell. And that goes out to the consumer and, and there's great uh, consumer appeal and recognition around the, around the world for proven winners plants. Um, a wealth of data, of course, all the propagators are involved in proven winners, uh, put as much data as we can possibly put into the uh, the knowledge of the plant and hopefully for the landscaper there's less guesswork involved when they're when they're designing with a plant. Um, higher perceived value with a brand recognition if you're a landscape designer or you're an installer and you're putting our white pots out into the landscape folks will recognize that as something that's worth more and and, and a landscaper installing these plants can can market that and charge more for it too. Um, and then improved genetics that solve real problems. And that's what the bulk of this presentation is about. Um, I mentioned earlier the 15 perennials for landscapes. This is a list of varieties that are just rock solid dynamite upgrades over old standbys. And, and this is a list that's gonna be solid for a long time to come. We're not gonna make any dramatic changes to it or, or swap any, any varieties in and out of it for the, the very near future at least. Um, these are plants that we have the supply chain ironed out on and we can ramp up production should someone do a big design, a big commercial project with, with these plants and want to involve thousands of a variety or, or so forth. Uh, the ability to do that is there. And, and they're, they're selected as plants that really are a, a dynamite, you know, maybe they're a look, look alike over the old standby in the case of of uh, Dianthus, our Paint the Town series, side by side to some of those old standbys that the landscapers use um, is just a world of difference. The picture may look the same, but when it's in the landscape and you can see it performing, it's just unparalleled. Um, so the first sort of group of plants are widely used landscape plants that needed a little bit of work and hey, we delivered. Uh, you know, go out on the website and you look, or out on the web and you, you look for, for problems with plants and, and you can see all sorts of posts about, can anything be done to keep our ornamental glass, grasses from flopping? A big problem with old genetics are, hey, panicums that flop over, uh, you know, miscanthus that don't stand up. Uh, and we've answered that problem with a couple of varieties. First one is Panicum Prairie Winds Apache Rose. Apache Rose, a wonderful, wonderful variety. A little bit shorter than some of the blue Panicums out there on the marketplace, but incredibly upright and beautiful rose-colored flowers on top. Um, and in this presentation, I tried to um, also put some of the, the other characteristics that go along. 
hey, folks that are in the cut flower business can can cut these panicums and put them in arrangements and dried flower arrangements. And um, this panicum and all others are deer resistant and they can handle some different moisture, uh, you know, in different soils and good winter interests. The frost on these beautiful flower heads is great. And this is a native cultivar. This is a selection from native plants of Panicum brigatum. Um, also, uh, you know, when we're talking about designing with proven winter perennials, uh, this one pairs really well with, with our black pearl hookera and, our, um, and a lot of our uh, baptisias. Um, because, uh, you know, it does well in a well-drained soil and both of those plants do well in that case too. And, as a trio, these would be in color at different times of the year, and uh, and and they're all all three native cultivars. Um, if if uh, Apache rose is a little too short, try totem pole. Uh, totem pole is a perfect statue, and it's six feet tall. Here in the gardens at Walter's Gardens, totem pole stays a perfect statue, a perfect upright plant all the way through when we trim it down in March or April. Even the dried foliage doesn't lodge or open up. Uh, it's just perfectly upright. Blue steel foliage and powdery blue stems. Um, it's a great application for narrow places in the landscape. Um, and you know, same attributes as, as uh, Apache Rose. And here we've got it paired with some of our beautiful semerific hibiscus. That one is Holy Grail. And then, uh, and then some of our uh, Heliopsis that we'll talk about in a little bit. Again, all three native selections. Another floppy plant that needed some upgrading is, is uh, Russian Sage. And here you can see the original and on the left side, uh, you know, the straight species. And on the right side, you can see a variety that has little in its name. And here it's not so little in our linear beds. Um, obviously this shot of Dunham and Lace is a summer shot while it still has foliage on it, but you can see it's another perfect statue. Dunham and Lace Porowskia just doesn't open up. It's a really great upright habit. Beautiful lacy foliage, nice uh, bright sky blue flowers on amethyst calyxes. Um, again, a good cut flower, good dried flower, another fairly deer resistant one because it's in the mint family and the foliage doesn't taste that well to a deer. Um, you know, adaptable to a couple of different types of soils, um, good for winter interest. Um, it was our perennial plant of the year in Proven Winters this past year too, so it had lots and lots of even billboard uh, exposure to the consumers, so good recognition around the around the industry and around the consumers as well. Here we've got it paired with Daisy May Leucanthemum and Violet Riot uh, Salvia. Um, we do have two Porowskias in the Proven Winter lineup. Sage Advice is another one. It's a little bit taller, uh, but every bit is as statuesque as Denim and Lace. It's just a great upright variety that doesn't flop, it doesn't lodge, doesn't open up the way that some of the old stuff does. Uh, this one has solid leaves where denim and lace is a lacy leaf and it's a much darker uh, color flower than denim and lace. Uh, so a little more purple to it. Um, pairs really well with oranges and blues in this case. So we have Primal Scream and, and uh, Stand By Me uh, Clematis, a great pairing. Uh, and, you know, hey, color, great color combos that a lot of people are thinking of these days, uh, oranges and blues. Um, it seems to be a great trend and we're working on some nice pairings of oranges and blues outside of the ones that we just mentioned. Another problem you see people, consumers asking questions on uh, out there in the web is, is sedums that look like this, that make a pancake. They get up to the beautiful, you know, great looking foliage and beautiful flowers in this late summer and early fall and then they do this. They, they get stem rot or crown rot and then they flop. Um, Pure Joy is a great answer to that in the entire Rock and Round series. Um, mostly because these are shorter. These are a great mushroom cap habit uh, and an individual plant is just that. It's a, a foot tall and a foot wide and it's totally covered in flowers when you when you see it in bloom, but 
you never see it opening up or making any spaces or flattening the way that a lot of others do. It's not prone to any of that, that crown rod or stem rod either. Um, Pure Joy is a great landscape plant because of that, whether it's, um, uh, whether it is uh, uh, in one or in mass, it, it just keeps that form really well. Uh, Pure Joy happens to have bubblegum pink flowers and the rest of the series we've got a richer pink and bundle of joy and uh, a white and pride and joy. Uh, this pairs really well with our nepetas. Uh, I believe the picture here is uh, cat's pajamas uh, or cat's meow one or the other. I think it's cat's meow actually. And then uh, going bananas uh, uh, daylily. Uh, and here's the other two, Pride and Joy and Bundle of Joy, the Rock and Round collection. Next is uh, Leucanthemum Amazing Daisies, Daisy May. Uh, what an upgrade over other Shasta daisies. It's just great flower power. It's a perfect form. It's a great habit. Again, you don't see that opening up or flopping and lodging. And, uh, you know, stays very compact. And... This one, if you come through with the shears occasionally, you can get nearly infinite rounds of flowers. We've gotten as many as five rounds of flowers on Daisy May uh, in a perfect season in Michigan, and certainly not unheard of to get three and four very consistently. Um, so multiple, multiple rounds of flowers, especially when deadheaded in a really just a great form, and that's unheard of in a lot of other Shasta daisies. Um, makes a good pot crop because of that. Uh, or container plant mixed in combos. It's a good pollinator plant, good cut flower plant. Um, here it's paired with, with our um, Paint the Town Dianthus and Denim and Lace Perovskia. Hey, sweet romance, we like to think is, is about as close as you can get to a perfect lavender. Uh, it's a great compact habit. It doesn't need to be sheared to keep a nice form. The flowers are bigger. The color is so nice and rich on it. It's proven to be a very hardy. It's a great cut flower, a good dried flower. Deer and rabbit resistance because it's fragrant. Uh, because it's so compact, it does well in containers. It does well where it's dry with good drainage. And um, again, a great pollinator attractor. And we, we, we pair it with one of our, with one of our hookeras. Here is uh, wild berry and with, uh, with uh, Daisy May. Here's Going Bananas that I mentioned earlier. It's part of our Rainbow Rhythm collection of Emericalis. And uh, happy and Going Bananas is really a massively improved Happy Returns. This one has, has uh, ever, semi-evergreen foliage and that allows the plant to come into flower quite a bit sooner than your, than your typical Happy Returns. And it also keeps it in flower longer later in the season. It has a lot more uh, flower stalks when it's in production and a higher bud count when it's in production as well. So a really great improvement on an old favorite. Uh, a lot of folks design with, with hemorrhocalis because they're so salt tolerant. They can be put next to uh, you know, your, your cement walkways where you would put salt down in the wintertime. And, uh, because it's so floriferous, it's going to be in color a lot of times through the season. Uh, a lot of the other uh, repeat blooming daisy or <laughs> daisies, a lot of other repeat blooming um, daylilies, they do need a little bit of deadheading and a little bit of watering to keep them in that constant production through the summer. And this one is is definitely like that, but because of that semi evergreen foliage, it's it's. Uh, going to do it a little bit more on its own without that extra help. Uh, these tend to be rabbit resistant, uh, can handle a lot of different moisture and soil conditions. They're good pollinator attractors. I'd pair it with uh, cat's, cat's meow or cat's pajamas as well as pure joy sedum or one of the other rock and round collection. Here's primal screen that I showed earlier in that blue and, and orange combo. This is an awesome daylily. This one is a tetraploid, uh, which is different than, than, uh, than uh, going bananas in that 
tetraploids tend to not be as consistent of rebloomers, but they reward you in gigantic flowers with an extremely high bud count. And so for a lot of consumers, a lot of homeowners, your tetraploid daylilies actually can be a longer season of color than a typical rebloomer or a diploid. Uh, because even though they're a little bit more one and done with their, with their flower season, while they're in bloom, it's a long season and it's a huge impact when they're doing it. So primal scream is massive seven and a half to eight inch diameter flowers. And they glimmer uh, tangerine orange, gold dusted blossoms and a green throat. Very tall, graceful scapes. And that's what you get with that extra chromosome with a tetraploid is great big flower stalks and big, big flower buds and lots of substance to the foliage. Um, Again, deer, er, excuse me, rabbit resistant, good pollinator attractor, um, pairs well with nepetas and with our, here I've got it also with our stand by me clematis for that blue and orange combo. Here's Violet Riot uh, Salvia from our Color Spires collection. Hey, uh, you know, May Night of Old is a wonderful plant. This improves on the wonderful. So what's the improvement? Constant color, uh, you can get it to rebloom multiple times throughout the summer and full size flowers when it does it. So, the old genetics would be a full size flower in May or so, you'd trim it back and you get a half size flower and then they're done. Uh, Violet Riot and some of the other ones from our genetics, you can get full size flowers multiple times throughout the year. Um, and this one is a nice compact habit. When it's not in bloom, it, it's a nice bushy green instead of a sprawling uh, pile of foliage. Um, landscapers love salvia nemorosa because uh, it, they are deer and rabbit resistant. They're also salt tolerant and they can handle a variety of soils from very dry sand to um, you know, fairly wet clay. They're huge pollinator attractors and they're in our, our proven pollinator collection because of that. Here it's paired with uh, very awesome uh, hibiscus and, and going bananas day lily. Okay, one more. Um, attack of the cat, mint. It's a monster. You know, some of the old cat mints just take over a yard and there's consumers out there asking about how to fix that. And we've answered that with cat's meow, uh, we think is a perfect landscape nepeta. Um, still gets a three foot size and width uh, in a lot of places, uh, but not four foot and certainly not flopping all over itself the way that some of the old ones would be. The reason cat mint is, in a, is a popular landscape plant is, is because it can handle a variety of soils, a variety of, um, you know, situations and moisture. Once it's established, it's, it's basically carefree deer rabbit resistant, again, salt tolerant, um, big pollinator attractors here too, but some of the big ones would just get so big that they'd be a maintenance nightmare. You'd have to untangle them and basically shear them off at the ground. And that's not the case with cat's meow. It's just a really nice mound of foliage. Um, because of that, because of its tidiness, you can pair it with things like um, Pure Joy Sedum and, and again, our, our Going Bananas Daylily. That's a great, just a great combination plant. If Cat's Meow is a little bit too big, here's our proven winner perennial of the year for this year, 2021, is Cat's Pajamas. And actually this is the best selling proven winter perennial of all proven winter perennials. And it's only going into its third season in production. Um, it's a little smaller, it's a, it's, a little bit smaller than two feet. So it's a really impeccable habit where it gets up to a certain size and that's it. Doesn't flop or lodge or open up. What's different about cat's pajamas though beyond its size is it only, it, um, it blooms from bottom to top when it's in bloom and the foliage is more green than some of the others. And so that makes that, that bluish color in the calyx is really pop. It makes it a, appear to be a richer color in pictures. And so it's incredibly photogenic. It also blooms earlier than all the other nepetas. So it actually directly follow, follows up a lot of your creeping flocks in the springtime. Uh, so it's very early to come into color. And for retailers, it would 
would be sort of one after the other. And, and while we're talking in terms of landscape, um, you know, you can put a few cat's pajamas in front of the border and, and then you can put some cat's meow behind and you'd have a succession of flowers. Um, back to that blue and purple, blue and, and orange uh, kind of combo, uh, it pairs, pairs well with our primal scream and our, our standby me clematis. So that's some of the, the big heavy hitters in the landscape. Uh, the next group of plants are landscape plants that were fine to begin with, but we found some really cool traits that we had to bring to the market. Um, first up is Amsonia storm cloud. So here's a selection from nature. It's a native cultivar. Um, there's other Amsonia tabernacle. I, I can never pronounce the species name on, on this Amsonia, forgive me. Um, out on the market, but storm cloud is the only one with jet black stems uh, in the spring. And these beautiful stems are a wonderful contrast to the, the really nice sky blue flowers. Um, the flowers are, are nice for a couple weeks in the spring and then the plant is a beautiful shrubby green all summer long. Great habit and doesn't get necrotic or uh, yellow like, like a lot of other uh, Amsonias out there either. Um, it's a lighter green color, but, but not yellow and sick looking. Um, and that, that black stem is a great contrast all the time. And this can take wetter sites. It can be a good cup flower. Again, on the deer resistant side, so that's always important. Um, and back to the native thing, uh, pairs well with our, our summerific hibiscus that are native cultivars and in our heliopsis as well. Here's those jet black stems coming out of the ground. And isn't that a great, great uh, shocking color to see in the spring? Next is uh, a, a, a hosta, which, you know, there's lots and lots of hostas out there, but nothing quite like Autumn Frost that was our proven winner's hosta of the year a couple years ago. This one keeps that great contrasting yellow margin for a long time through the summer. And it's great substance too. They're a heavy, heavy duty leaf. It's just not grandma's hosta. It's a really great um, compact plant. It, it fits well into a lot of situations in the shade. Um, if you don't use hostas in your designs, they definitely need consistent moisture. So consider that. And they're certainly not deer resistant. Uh, in a lot of cases, they're deer food. So in, in places where a deer walk through, you want them in a fenced in yard. But our autumn frost is really a great color and holds up really well through the summer where a lot of, a lot of similar variegations really fade into white really early and, and then they're very washed out looking color. For a shade combo, mix it with a lot of our, our hookahs. Um, Black Pearl is a great one that will do well in sun or shade. So here's a great shade combo on our landscape list. And then uh, Chantilly Lace of Runcus, a really nice alternative to a still be. Here's some more of the Shadowland collection. Um, just this past year, we had Coast to Coast as a great yellow, which again, not grandma's yellow hosta. A lot of the old yellow hostas would fade and to be more green through the summer. Uh, and Coast to Coast gets richer yellow through the summer. Diamond Lake is an awesome heavy, heavy substance blue. That's a very, very vigorous grower. It's a future host of the year for 2022. Uh, and then we is our host of the year for 2021. And this is a nice small one with a really great uh, waving uh, high substance uh, characteristic to it. So uh, uh, high substance uh, texture. And then your ultimate big is Empress Wu. This is the biggest hosta in commerce. And we use, we use people to show how big this plant is, um, both from a small little girl standing in front and the plant bigger than her to an adult uh, even bigger than her once it's more mature. And speaking of using people to, to uh, promote our plants, here's my daughters, uh, Stella in front of one of our baptizas and Hattie by, um, by one of our hookahs. Uh, and another person to show off some of our plants, here's Ashlyn. She's the daughter of one of our third generation owners. She's Krista's daughter. And Ashlyn's uh, talking about magenta sprite flocks. And this is a hybrid flocks 
that's a quite a bit different than your typical creeping flox. It blooms later than, than regular creeping flox, and it's a mounding habit rather than spreading to the neighbor's yard. And the hybrid characteristics that are in it help it bloom a little later. So for retailers, it's a little better time frame for blooming. In the landscape, it, um, it'll mix well with some other spring plants, uh, but still be one of the earliest to bloom. And the biggest thing about it is when it's not in bloom, it's a rich green color. It doesn't brown out the way that a lot of other creeping flocks would. They can handle some, some drier, uh, you know, quick drain, drainage sites, a little more moisture as well. They attract pollinators and they are native crosses. Um, we've got a paired here with our ornamental oregano that I'll talk in a little bit, as well as our French vanilla semerific hibiscus that we'll talk about later too. Here's black pearl that's come up in a couple of the combos. Really, this is a great jet black, you know, the ultimate black hookera, or ultimate black corbels. It's taller than some of the others on the market. Um, the leaves are, are heavy substance. Um, they, don't, they don't brown in the sun. They can hold up really well where there's sun. They can handle the shade as well. And they have a lot of hookera velosa parentage in them that makes them very vigorous and come out of the ground really quickly in the spring. But the key with any hookera, especially our primo selection in that, in that velosa parentage, is they really need fast drainage in the landscape. If you put them in the front of the border and if you have heavy clay soils, they just are not going to be a very long-lived perennial. If you put them in a place where, where they have good drainage underneath and, and they're not standing wet, especially through the winter, um, they can live for a fair, fair bit of time. Um, Black Pearl has some nice rosy purple undersides to it, so you get a little bit of multicolor uh, action there. Uh, they can be deer resistant because of those hairy stems from the Hookera velosa parentage, but that's not always the case. It depends on how hungry the, the deer are. Um, consistent moisture, they're not necessarily drought tolerant, but they do need that, again, that, that fast drainage. They're good. Um, pollinator attractors. The flowers can be good in arrangements. And again, they're sort of a native native hybrid too. I mentioned earlier their, their shade pairing would be a great with autumn frost hosta and a, um, Chantilly lace aruncus, but a great sun combination would be um, one of our baptisias and one of the panicums that I mentioned earlier. Here's a few more of the primos. Got wild rose, mahogany monster, Peachberry ice and pretty pistachio. In our Dolce collection, the more medium size, this is a uh, quickly becoming one of our best selling uh, hookeras. This one's wild berry. Um, this one has a glossy leaf compared to the wild rose. That's more of a more of a matte finish, and it's a little smaller, um, but it's incredibly. It's really quite vigorous. It's got great charcoal veining to it and um, really nice contrast to a lot of things. Pairs well with, uh, with Sweet Romance Lavender as well as uh, Daisy May Leucanthemum. All right, so next group of, of plants is uh, plants that aren't universally used as landscape plants, but they sure should be. Oh, some more questions from consumers. What's wrong with my Dianthus? It's just melting away. Hey, a big problem with Dianthus is a lot of people put them in the front of the border and just like those hookeras, they need fast drainage. They don't like wet feet. And a lot of the older genetics just can't stand wet, wet or humidity at all. Um, and we've uh, done our best at Walters and Proven Winners Perennials to, to uh, select for plants that are a little more forgiving of some of that moisture and also can withstand some, some heat and humidity through the summer. And our Painted Town Dianthus really are those plants. They've answered that problem. Uh, so a lot of Dianthus of old, especially in the front of the border, would be a two or three year perennial and they would just kind of rot in the middle and melt away over seasons. And we have some Painted Town fuchsias in our landscape that, that are five and six years old and they're just growing over one another rather than melting away, they get more robust and thicker as years go on. Um, so trialed all over the country for heat and humidity tolerance. Their foliage is a beautiful glaucous blue and they're not in, in bloom. So a really nice uh, 
look to them and as a as sort of a ground cover. They bloom earlier than a lot of a dianthus too. Our Paint the Town series is one of the first to bloom. So they they come into color really nicely. I would say deer avoid them. They have some fragrance to them. Uh, they're good pollinator attractors. And they, they're a little bit adaptable. This variety or this series is a little bit adaptable, a little bit forgiving of some more moisture. They're not, again, not, not drought, drought tolerant, but they don't like wet feet whatsoever. Um, pairs well in that, that kind of quick drying sort of soil uh, with our Violet Riot Salvia and our Denim and Lace Perovskia. Here's a few more of the Paint the Town series. There's two brand new additions for 2021. Paint the Town Fancy has a really nice uh, red eye and then Paint the Town Red along with our 2022 Proven Winter Perennial of the Year in Paint the Town Magenta. I mentioned earlier Chantilly Lace. This is really an underutilized perennial, uh, Aruncus in general, but Chantilly Lace is just an impeccable habit. It's a, it's a nice tall one when it matures. The young plant is short in terms of putting on a rack and shipping around, but when it gets older, it gets taller. It can get up to about 32 inches. Um, it's a great alternative to a stilby because it's a little more forgiving in terms of a drier site or a hot summer where in the shade it would get dry uh, for a period of time and then maybe some moisture would come back. A lot of a stilby is can't stand any periods of dry in the summertime where goat's beard or aruncus can really handle that nicely. And Chantilly lace, um, a nice thing about its flowers is when it is done blooming, all the flowers fade at once. And so it's not blotchy. Uh, it goes from the really nice white to a really nice uh, faded uh, sort of brown. And that brown looks just as nice in the landscape as the white does. Um, Again, pairs well with, with black pearl and autumn frost in the shade. Baptisia, this is a really the ultimate landscape plant because it lives forever and once it's established, it's not going any place. A lot of the Baptisias of old though, they take up a huge footprint in the landscape. Um, straight species Australis, hey, that's a, that's a burning bush footprint and doesn't take very many of them to, to fill up a pretty big space. And another drawback, if you would, of some of the older Baptisias is the flowers get mixed up in the foliage when they're in bloom. Uh, this Australis that I've got pictured is, is a great example of a beautiful plant, but the flowers are kind of hidden. So we've selected plants that are a little more narrow uh, and take up less space in the garden and, and more like a peony footprint rather than a a burning bush footprint and the flowers on the decadent series of, of Baptisias from Proven Winners and us uh, tend to sit on top of the plant too. So the, the show of flowers is, is much showier when they're in bloom. So here's sparkling sapphires as a great improvement over a blue, the typical blue Baptisia. And here's lemon meringue that's in our, our 15 perennials for the landscape and a great yellow. This is a huge, hugely vigorous uh, Baptisia. So it fills a pot, it fills a spot in the landscape quite quickly. And um, what a flower show when it's in bloom. Got a question here, back to the Aruncus. Um, the bloom length for Aruncus, I would say the flowers themselves is a solid two to three weeks. And then the, uh, the dried flower is probably two months after that. My Aruncus in my yard had had flowers on it for a solid three to three and a half months in my yard. So all summer long, it, it to me looked nice with the flowers. I, I never did trim the flowers off until it went, went uh, down in the fall. Um, but really nice bloom length. It doesn't have the repeat bloom like an Estilby does. And, but that's not a drawback because it, it fades and dries so nicely. Yeah, feel free to ask questions as we go along now that I'm almost done. <laughs> um, lemon meringue, uh, the nice thing about the Decadent series is they're a great height, great width. They're just a really great compact plant. And just like peonies, 
hey, they, they last forever once they're established. Um, native selections, um, they, they're pretty good short-lived cut flowers. They're not gonna be like a rose that lasts for two weeks in a vase, but uh, you know, they'd make a nice short-lived arrangement. Um, good to attract bees. Pairs well with our black pearl and with our panicum in the sun. Here's a couple more, a few more of the Decadence series. The Decadence Deluxe is a little bit taller uh, and, and uh, pink lemonade and pink truffles are both Decadence Deluxe, Deluxe and dark chocolate is our biggest pinnacle. It's a, it's a dark brown, almost black with up to 27 inch long panicles. And then Cherry's Jubilee is one of the most floriferous with kind of a mahogany reddish color. Next up is oregonum, drops of Jupiter. And there's not a lot of people using ornamental oregano in the landscape, but drops of Jupiter is a great new introduction uh, for 2021 that, that really would fit a great spot in the landscape. Um, I would treat it like a, a nepeta, like a, a cat mint with yellow leaves. And the yellow is much more intense in, in full sun. Um, it's still pretty as more of a chartreuse green and in less sun. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when it's young, it's a great mounding plant. Um, they, they will creep a little bit beyond that mound, but it's not going to naturalize the way that a lot of the old, or that uh, maybe the um, culinary oreganos will. It'll keep to its, its spot, if you will. So if you give it a little space, it'll fill in. Otherwise, it'll stay in that nice mound. Gets about three feet. And the purple flowers are later on in the summer, um, more like end of June and early July. And they're a great contrast against those yellow yellow leaves. Um, and uh, the foliage uh, gets a little bit of red to it in the fall. So it's a really great three season plant. Um, a little more consistent moisture maybe than a nepeta. Nepetas can handle it quite dry. Um, this will do well in, in fast drainage, but it needs some consistent moisture. Um, pairs well with our um, with our flocks um, and as well as French vanilla hibiscus for a nice yellow um, draw to it. Hey, keep an eye out for powdery mildew in your landscape. A whole bunch of plants that get powdery mildew and one of them that's notorious for getting, getting powdery mildew is a lot of the Heliopsis of old. You, you don't see a lot of false sunflowers used in landscapes, but uh, Tuscan gold is an exception in terms of mildew. It doesn't, I've never seen it get mildew, uh, much less hardly any leaf spots on some in, in really poor conditions. Um, this is a great compact plant. Again, it's another one that doesn't lodge and open up the way that some of the older ones did. In uh, constant flowers, once it begins in the summertime, even without much deadheading, it's gonna keep sending up some flowers. So lots and lots of color on Tuscan gold. Uh, very little disease issues, really nice and compact, so it's very low maintenance. Uh, a consistent moisture, not necessarily drought tolerant. It's a great pollinator attractor, good cut flower, good native selection. And because of that, we, we would make a nice pair here with, with uh, Berry Awesome Hibiscus and Storm Cloud Amsonia for multiple seasons. So you'd get an early and a middle and a late. Speaking of hibiscus, um, you know, some of those hibiscus of old just didn't make a good landscape plant because they're six or seven foot vase shaped plants with a few flowers on the top and you wouldn't be able to put very many in the landscape and there wouldn't be a lot of perennial borders that it would fit into. And here you can see in our comparison bed, some of the old ones um, here in the, the left picture, that red one in the back is a huge massive plant compared to our one of our reds in front of it. Um, and even a newer newer uh, cross on the right picture here is turn of the century, and that's a much bigger plant too than a lot of people would put in their landscape. Uh, you know, then move on to our, our perfect habit, uh, Berry Awesome. 
It's a great four foot, just rounded ball. Our, our hibiscus also are, are indeterminate, kind of like indeterminate tomatoes, they keep blooming and they also bloom from bottom to top rather than just being at the top of the plant. So when, when our summerific hibiscus are in bloom, you see them just covered in flowers. Um, so later on in the season, you get flowers from our very awesome. This one was a perennial plant of the year in 2019, a couple years ago. Um, just an impeccable habit. The flowers or the leaves, excuse me, are a really nice olive green, which is a great contrast to a lot of other plants in the landscape when it's not in flower. Um, definitely need consistent moisture. They can handle standing water uh, at, for periods in the summertime as well. A good pollinator plant, especially for hu uh, hummingbirds. Um, pairs well with that Heliopsis, the Tuscan gold, as well as uh, storm cloud Amsonia. Here's Holy Grail. Uh, another direction for hibiscus is, is dark foliage. So this has incredibly dark near black leaves against a really high substance red. It's really hard to get a red hibiscus with uh, much more than paper thin petals. And Holy Grail was one that took a long time to, to find that perfect combination of really dark foliage with a really high substance flower. Also with a really nice rounded habit. And that's why Holy Grail is a name because we took years and years and lots and lots of seedlings to get to this one. Um, and I'd pair it with uh, totem pole and with uh, Tuscan gold. And then last but not least, our smallest hibiscus to date is French vanilla. This is a three and a half uh, to four foot tall plant. So impeccable round habit, incredibly compact but still has that full size eight inch diameter dinner plate flower. And it's our first stab into a yellow color hardy hibiscus. So um, yellows in the past would, would open up with that creamy yellow and then they would totally fade to white. And our French vanilla keeps that yellow color for the duration of the flower. Uh, pairs well with our, our uh, phlox there and with uh, drops of Jupiter originum. I mentioned stand by me clematis a little bit ago. This is different than your than your vining type uh, clematis in that it's a bush. It's a deciduous clematis and it dies back to the ground in the winter time. So just like all the other perennials that we're talking about, you trim this right off at the ground once it's dormant and you don't have to worry about which type it is like the vining ones in terms of uh, pruning it. Um, it does need a little bit of support though. It, it doesn't stand up terribly well on its own. So it's a great plant for obelisks or to nestle in between other uh, plants in the landscape. Uh, this is a great cut flower plant because you trim the stems off nearly at the ground to put them in a vase and then the plant will reward you with new flowers and you get multiple rounds of flowers throughout the season. And then the dried flowers are really nice in, the, in a vase as well. These are deer and rabbit resistant. Uh, good pollinator plants and those nodding flowers are just a really nice look in the landscape. There's nothing quite like it. Uh, pairs well with uh, cat's pajamas nepeta and uh, primal scream daylily. And you know why do we want to talk about all these plants? Earlier I talked about the value. To me this looks really professional. Uh, we as landscapers we use the best tools, we use the best, uh, you know, we go to school to learn about best practices for pesticide application and we market ourselves as that, but so often a landscaper will find the cheapest possible plant they can find. Why not use the best plant you can find and charge more for it and market yourself as the one who buys the best plants. And it's easy to see when they're shown like this in their great packaging. I'm on a mission um, to get some more photography like that and to, to have a whole, a whole gallery to inspire landscapers and to, to use proven winners plants. And we're, we're enlisting some proven winners or we're enlisting some professional landscapers around the country and we're, we're giving them this really neat proven winners certified landscape professional designation. And the hope is, is that they'll 
they'll help to trial our plants and landscapes around the country and and make really nice combinations and help us to to really get some nice compositions together um, so that uh, you know, like what I was talking about with some of the pictures, plants that pair well together, we'll be able to catch some of these folks in the act of using our plants and uh, and nurseries can can utilize that data as well and 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 they'll they'll talk about you know their their local proven winter certified landscape professional endorses this composition of plants. So look for that in the future. Um, Smallscapes is a is a name that uh, that's used in the annual world over at Pleasant View. Um, we're going to call it something different, but we're working on some of these combinations, some of these compositions. And Popular Point Studio is one of our proven winners, certified landscape professionals, uh, Lee McGonigal, and she put together this nice little combination here with a few of our plants. And, um, over at Julie Moore Messer V Design Studio, Erica did this mailbox garden for us. Another, another direction to take it is signature design. So proven winners, signature designs. We have proven winners, signature gardens around the country that are high traffic and in a place where lots of tourists can be inspired by the plants. But we would inspire professionals around the industry with these designs in slightly less public areas. And so uh, something we did this last, last season was to install a signature design here in West Michigan that we'll be able to get lots of photography in a commercial setting of big swaths of our plants uh, together in combination. That's it for me. Um, questions? Crickets. <laughs> Well, folks, I hope it was, was a good webinar for you. Um, as always, feel free to reach out to us at Walters Gardens and Proven Winners Perennials and let us know how we, we can help you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, have a great day.